I think the host is being held by Stan. Mm -hmm. All right, whatever. Um, I have the host, Stan. Okay. You good? All right. I'm just going to go. So first I'll say, I'm, I was going to start with Sukkot's one of my favorite holidays, but that's basically every holiday is one of my favorite holidays. I'm just, whatever's happening now. Uh, I briefly went in because it was drizzling in our sukkah, not raining hard enough to spoil our soup, not raining hard enough to chase us in if we were eating dinner out here, but definitely enough water coming through the roof that with my computer, I went inside. So I love Sukkot. One of the main reasons I love Sukkot is I'm a huge history and sociology buff and Sukkot is probably the most pagan we get. Sukkot is the holiday that shows us exactly where we came from. I mean, it's ridiculous. I have this lovely home. See, I'll take you to this beautiful home here. It's warm. There are nice hardwood floors. You know, it's painted the colors we want. We redid the bathrooms. It's very comfortable. But instead, I am sitting in Ontario in a rickety booth. Um, when I was a kid, my parents took up, we actually tied to the house because otherwise it would lean like this by the end of the first Yom Tov. So we would have problems. Uh, but I'm sitting out here being dripped on a little bit and I'm happy about it. Why would I do that? It's ridiculous. But we Jews are pack rats. I actually take that from a colleague and classmate of mine, Rabbi Joel Alter. Once we start doing something, we just keep doing it. We do it forever and ever and ever. And Sukkot's that thing. So if you think about it, here we are. We're gonna live outdoors in all kinds of weather. Hot, cold, rain, hopefully not snow. We are going to also take, oh, I should grab my Lulav and Natural Globe. Maybe we'll get it later. Um, we're gonna take this, these four species. We're gonna put them together. We're gonna shake them around. And nothing says pagan to me like taking a long, stiff <laughs> lulav, putting it together with a round soft fruit together, shaking them and saying, please God, please. And part of that comes with, thanks, Stan. Part of that comes with <laughs> what we'll be talking about a little bit next week. It's time we spend with God. So where does this come from? I did a little research. I mean, I knew it was pagan. It's a little ridiculous. How can you not know it's pagan? But I wanted to find out exactly where it was from. And it turns out that ancient Israelites did not live in huts like this. Surprise, they didn't go to Home Depot. They didn't get plywood to put up their walls. They didn't have bamboo on their roof. They lived in tents. They didn't have a roof that was open because if you were in the desert right now, you don't really want a roof that's open to the stars. In what world is that a logical uh, harvest shelter? You want to lean to, you want a tent that you can crawl under, it's gonna provide shade, not more shade than sun, total shade. But the Canaanites, the Canaanites did build huts like this. There's a story in Canaanite tradition that Baal, one of their gods, decided to build his own palace. And according to a myth, he inscribed a tablet that said the God took seven days to build a home and he left a, a window in the ceiling of his home as a measure to allow the rains to fall on his land. So the sukkah 
represents earth in Canaanite tradition. And the reason you have to be able to see the stars and you have to be open to the elements is because Baal decreed that the rain should be able to fall through from the, from the sky onto the earth. And here we are living in that same sort of uh, same sort of sukkah that the rain can fall through and the sun can shine through. And this has uh, borne itself out, <coughs> excuse me, if this story has of course borne itself out in some of the archeological uh, discoveries that have been found in, in ancient Israel. So here we are connected to the ancient Canaanites, which does throw a monkey wrench into the, uh, some of the more recent claims by some of the Palestinian ex extremists are that they, descended, they are descended from the ancient Canaanites. And here we are having a tradition, our, our holiday that looks just like an ancient Canaanite holiday. And so this is what we did. That wasn't Jewish. It was Canaanite. No, we can adapt it. We had it first. Now in doing my research, I also will tell you that if you say this to certain groups within our own, with our, in our own community, but not ours. This could never happen with Judaism. But here we are, archeological evidence and everything. Now, turns out, surprise, everyone raise your hand if you're surprised. It's possible that the Lulav and Etrog, thanks Zach, the Lulav and Etrog are also an ancient Canaanite tradition. <coughs> we later in the Talmud say they represent. The spine, the lulav represents the spine, the myrtle, the eyes, the willow, the mouth. If you think of put a willow leaf sideways like lips. And then of course the, the etrog, the heart. And so the lulav is flexible, but doesn't bend completely. The eyes are always, should always be open. Um, and you should, your mouth not necessarily always open. So the willow doesn't look like a open mouth. It looks like a closed mouth. And then of course the heart should be something that has, um, is pleasant to all. And the etrog has a pleasant smell. And also um, we're gonna find out a taste that can be used in different recipes, right Zach? Excellent. So there are a couple of other things I wanna tell you about sukkah. So my sukkah, is made of pressed wood, boards, and plywood. When we lived in North Carolina, it was hanging curtains. When we lived in Hawaii, it was lattice work with big giant windows. But if you lived in ancient Babylonia, two interesting things you can use to make a wall of your sukkah, a whale or an elephant. But there is a machloket on the elephant. Rabbi Yehuda said, you can use an elephant. Rabbi Mayer said, no, you can't use an elephant because it could walk away. <laughs> a dead elephant, a dead elephant, as long as it was still tall enough to be a sukkah wall, that would be okay. Why anyone would want to make lie, sleep, eat next to a dead elephant, I do not know. Um, also, Zach asked me the question, can you build the sukkah hanging off the elephant so that the, you have a floor and the elephant is a wall and you create a wall. So if it walks away, it takes you with it. Um, I did not find any discussion of a mobile sukkah. However, Chabad has come up with a mobile sukkah and they have no problem putting a sukkah on a tree.
because you have a stable floor, walls, and please do bolt a sukkafint. I know you sent that privately, but I'm sharing it anyway. <laughs> a sukkah. You can build it and take it around and then invite everyone into your sukkah in order to um, in order to say the bracha for Sukkot and uh, enjoy your your mobile elephant sukkah. I don't know exactly how much time I have. I don't want to take up too much of, of uh, Zach's time. But I want to tell you that one other one other tradition that I may, uh, we'll probably talk more about next week. There is a particular um, a particular service that was performed in the temple at this time called Beit HaShoeva, Simchat Beit HaShoeva, which is um, the water pouring, the pouring of the water. Shoeva is the pouring out of water. And it was a very raucous time in the ancient temple. Interestingly, it occurred in, um, in the Ezrat Nashim, traditionally called the women's section. It's what the women's section in an Orthodox shul is, is referred to, or at the Kotel, the women's section is Ezrat Nashim, the women's area. Interestingly, this is the only time during the year where the men and women were actually separated. And it was a time when people became so involved in dance and singing and craziness that they actually would put up a machitza separating the men and women for this one ceremony during the year. Um, while it was called the water pouring ceremony, it was also a time when there was a lot of, of um, drinking. And I think it sounds, talking about paganism, sounds a little bit like uh, probably a bacchanal, more so than uh, what you might have expected the ancient temple to be. So this is the one time a year when they actually separated the men and the women for this particular particular uh, ceremony. And stories of it in the Talmud also say that the dancers would carry lighted torches and there'd be music. And of course, having spent three years in Hawaii, I start thinking of Hawaiian dancers swinging fire and it becomes a totally different image than um, we imagine in the ancient temple. But we weren't so far from our pagan roots back then. And I think that this, this particular holiday takes us to remind us that we're, we're not always so far we may think we're very intellectual, especially we in the conservative movement. We think we're really intellectual. We're very into learning. We're very into doing things right. But uh, Sukkot comes as a little reminder that we're not so far from paganism. And there's nothing wrong with that, with, with a little bit of, of enjoyment in that, in that piece. I'm going to pass this over to Sari if there are, to let people unmute if there are questions, have a little discussion, and then... Zach can sing for us. And Zach is also going to teach us how to make etrog liqueur. And by the way, we have a stash. We've been doing it for several years. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'm not quite sure on the timing of this because um, it's now 545. And I'm also not sure what we're doing about Kabbalah Shabbat because basically well, there is none tonight. There isn't one. There's only two there. Psalms. So then maybe what we should do is let Zach do his two psalms and then we can answer if there are questions for Jen and then you can teach us how to make et drug liqueur, which is really good. I really, really, really suggest that you pay close attention because we make et drug liqueur. We go around collecting all of the leftover et drug uh -huh. and it takes several weeks or several months, but by next Sukkot, you will have great liquor. Oh, actually I do the short version. So it's a, a lot faster. You can have it in about two weeks. Oh, then I need to learn this. Ours takes months. Um, this is it. We'll actually be able to take you full the full, through the full recipe. So this week we're gonna do the first half, the prep, and then next week we're gonna do the dilution and blending. Okay. All right. So why don't we do the Psalms and then we'll do question and then we can do and does that, first of all, does anybody have questions? No questions. Is okay. It, uh, makes life Psalms. easy. 
Kabbalat Shabbat. So, but before we go to that, I just want to thank Saray and Merkaz USA and Jen and Stan, Merkaz Canada for partnering with us on this, this program, uh, partnering with the Kiddush Club and, uh, you know, and also Margie Miller representing Women's League. This is really a movement wide thing and we really greatly appreciate everybody's participation, particularly Stan and Alan who've, dri who've driven the bus on this. And we thank you. And I want to tell you, we thank really you. are happy to do it. And it's the most fun thing that I do with the least amount of work. I invite people to a drink on Friday afternoon. What could be more fun? Awesome. Awesome. Zach, you ready? Sure. All right. So we are starting with the only two psalms we do pre-Chag are the psalm for Shabbat and Adonai Malach Yut Lavesh. So 90 something and 90 something. 92 and 93, and whichever CDR you happen to be using. Do we want to have a little fun with it? Sure. Cool. Let's see if it works. I don't know, I'm a lucky 
più la vejo la deixa, non è il risultato con di Monti. Edo tecnum mi ol vid canava codejaronai le ore chiami. Are we doing Kaddish? Yeah. Jen, Kaddish? Those that would like to, please rise. Please unmute. Mute. Uh, and we'll do Kaddish the Rabbanon. Rabbanon. The Rabbanon. Okay. That one I don't have, completely have memorized. They stick with words in different places. All right. Kaddish just... Rabbanon. It's only a few pages past. Yitkadal v Yitkadash Shemei. Amen. <laughs> Al Yisrael, vi al Rabbanon, vi al Tamidehon, vi al Kol Tamidei Tamidehon, vi al Kol Man Diasin, vi al Raita, di vi al Tana Hadin, vi di al Kol Atar, yehe l'chon l'chon, shalom rava, chino v'chizda, v'chayin arikin, arikin, u'mizona arikin, Amen. <laughs> Okay, okay, so making etrog cello part one. So, sure. so if you want to see how to finish this, you have to tune in next week. That's the whole point. <laughs> Obviously, we can't use an etrog quite yet because uh, I'm going to cut it into pieces or at least take the skin off, which we can't do before the cog starts. But luckily, we have a uh, colloquial substitute. We have a lemon. So if I can get it to do this, oh, lower there we go. Can you see the lemon? Yep. Yes. Pith will actually, the white part, will actually turn your uh, liqueur sour. So you want to try and avoid that. And I like to try and get as much of the skin off in one piece as I can. It takes a little more practice. Oh, but I got one nice long piece and you're gonna want a jar. I'm using this old soup jar. My help and is uh, whoops. The other reason I like using the jar is because if you can't get it all in one nice, it makes it easier to get it all out next week. You can, of course, just drop the, the lemon peel in the bottle, but again, it's hard to get out at the end of next week. And then you can't use the bottle for your finished product. We ask that everybody mute, please. I don't have that power. Let's see if I do. <laughs> so when you finish peeling you should have your lemon peel in the jar and you should have a bare lemon or etrog depending on what you're using now because the I can only unmute myself. That's the problem. Where did you? That was the last thing you heard. Anyway, okay. So you'll end up with the 
lemon peel in the bottom of the jar. Don't be surprised if it's really hard to get the etrog um, off in big pieces because it's really bumpy at the bump, uh, if, you, if you like a bumpy etrog. Um, so that's why the other reason I like using the jar because it's easier to filter out the pieces at the end. And then you can use whatever bottle or jar you want for the finished product. Now comes the important part. Oh, let's see, how do I? I didn't set up a second camera this time. Okay, the important part. When it comes to vodka, you believe it or not, stronger is better. Although I did not have any ever clear in the house. I have this old bottle that nobody ever drinks from. So we're, this is what we're going to use for today. Uh, but stronger is better. The stronger the alcohol content or the higher the alcohol content, the more of that citric oil will get pulled out of the lemon. Um, also, the higher the proof of alcohol, when we go down to dilute it, we you will end up with more product to do. Now, one of the things I like to do with this is save it, and I rebottle it and package it in nice little bottles with nice little labels, and I give it away for Mishloch Manot at Purim. So, so, Zach, in the recipe we have, we need 100 proof vodka. And there uh, is if you can, get the, if you can find the Everclear that's uh, 151 or 190 something, that's even better. Wow. Fire is better. It's and do you use one, two, yellow five, retro five, game? Have it here. What it was? The, uh, you guys were talking on top of each other. And it's I know, Joey, yes, you have it. Ever clear. You have it in New Jersey. Yes, I know. <laughs> oh, I have it in my garage. All right. What was the other question? Do you prefer yellow etro game? Uh, it doesn't matter, but the green ones won't taste as lemony. Okay. They will have a different. They will have a different taste to them. Okay. Uh, I've actually, now that I'm thinking about it, never made it with a green etrog. Anyway. What do you do with the pitum? Does with it the matter what? if the etrog has a pitum or not? No, that's one of the nice things. That's the other reason it matters. It doesn't matter. You're doing it at the end of the holiday. <laughs> um, so and if you want to buy them, you can get the ones that they can't sell because the pitum broke. It still makes great liqueur. It makes great liqueur, and they'll sell them to you for really, really cheap, especially after the holiday. Actually, yeah. God uses them without pitum. Yeah. Um, so once you've got it all filled up, you put your lid on and you'll want to leave it stored for a week or two. Give it just a quick little shake to make sure you got the, um, it gets into all the little nooks and crannies, but leave it, let it sit now for a week or two. We're obviously going to let it sit for a week and then, uh, we'll move on to the next <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 